And let's turn our attention now directly to the state of the world economy. And let's face it, there are challenges. There was a period, a long period, where the countries, especially in the US and other countries in the West, kept their interest rates really down. That led to debt building up. It led to a prolonged party. Asset prices were doing well. The stock market was going up. Everything seemed nice. But as with any bubble, that is tough to sustain over a long period of time. And in recent years, inflation has raised its head. Rising debt burdens have raised their head. And then, of course, the war between uh, Russia and Ukraine actually knocked the bottom, in a sense, out of this very rosy picture on the global economy that we were seeing. So we're going to turn our attention a little bit to try and tell you what is actually happening with the global economy. Is there going to be high interest rates for a long time? Is there going to be a recession? And what, therefore, could the impact be for India and, crucially, for the India story? Is it a problem for the India story or is it potentially an opportunity? Talks of a possible recession in the US have been swirling for several months now. Since last year, US has been facing one crisis after another. High inflation and interest rate hikes by Federal Reserve have been front and center amid the various challenges facing the economy. In fact, one of the reasons for the banking crisis last year was the sudden and aggressive rate hikes undertaken to curb inflation. In determining the extent of additional policy firming that may be appropriate to return inflation to 2% over time, the committee will take into account the cumulative tightening of monetary policy, the lags with which monetary policy affects economic activity and inflation, and economic and financial developments. We will continue to make our decisions meeting by meeting, based on the totality of the incoming data and their implications for the outlook for economic activity and inflation, as well as the balance of risks. Added to that, the impact of the Ukraine war on energy prices and supply chains is taking its toll as well. Over the last few weeks, the U.S. economy has been hit by a fresh set of challenges. The auto strike by the biggest U.S. auto workers union is expanding. As per reports, around 25,000 workers are on strike in 21 states. This strike has cost the economy billions of dollars. We got tears. We don't got cost of living adjustment, which has been part of every UAW contract since 1948 until 2009 when they said, look, we'll sacrifice. We'll take a hit so we can keep you all afloat. Not that they need help to stay afloat. The big three is, you know, literally turning their backs on them. They're making record profits. It's about time to reward the very people for the reason they were even able to, again, survive, again, the Great Recession. There are other indicators as well, which could be worrisome. U.S. manufacturing activity contracted in September for the 11th straight month. While this is a red flag, the silver lining is that the slump has been lower than analyst expectations. A last-minute deal to circumvent a government shutdown does not address the issues at hand, but simply pushes the immediate risks further down the road. Reports say a shutdown could impact GDP growth, knocking off a percentage point. Millions of American students will start getting student loan bills this month after the three-and-a-half-year pandemic freeze expired. This could further hit the GDP numbers. A combination of all these factors show that the economy isn't out of the woods just yet. The question remains, how resilient is the US economy and what could be that tipping point where it slips into a recession? So clearly there is an opportunity in all of this for India, but we should also warn that there could be consequences. India is the bright spark in the global economy right now, but there could be an impact. If there's actually a recession or stagflation hitting the West and hitting the global economy, there could be an impact on India. These, for example, could be some of the repercussions. Despite various challenges, both at home and abroad, the Indian economy has demonstrated remarkable resilience in the past year, poised to be among the fastest growing globally. 
Recent decisions by the Reserve Bank of India, including a pause on rates in recent credit policy meetings and a downward trend in inflation numbers, have fueled expectations that the central bank may maintain the status quo on rates for a while, potentially leading to future interest rate cuts contingent on the trajectory of inflation. So far as the Reserve Bank is concerned, we have identified high inflation as a major risk to macroeconomic stability and sustainable growth. According to our monetary, accordingly, our monetary policy remains resolutely focused on aligning inflation to the 4% target on a durable basis. The MPC met on 4th, 5th and 6th October 2023. After a detailed assessment of the evolving macroeconomic and financial developments and the outlook, it decided unanimously to keep the policy repo rate unchanged at 6.5%. In the hypothetical scenario of a U.S. recession, some experts opine that the impact on India might be less pronounced than initially anticipated. India's robust domestic market and internal demand act as significant buffers. India has taken strategic measures to mitigate potential effects, such as diversifying trade and investment partnerships. However, it is inevitable that any recession will have some impact on India, with certain sectors being more vulnerable than others. Exports, particularly in sectors like IT and pharma, could likely bear the brunt initially. The severity of this impact hinges on the depth of the potential recession. Well, it's a great pleasure now to be joined by Daniel Giltrude, business analyst and economist. Daniel, uh, if you could just take a look at the state of the world economy right now. Uh, what's your sense? There seems to be a growing feeling that inflation could be persistent. Recession may well be something that we are thinking about. So stagflation could be there. Uh, there seems to be a reasonable amount of uh, pessimism around. Uh, how do you see the situation? Well, it's very difficult to predict exactly what's going to happen in terms of will a recession hit. So what we need to do is look at the trends. That's what's important right now. And when we look at the trends and we see rising interest rates and we see inflation that remains stubborn, we see a job market in the United States which is starting to cool down. We see savings which had built up during the pandemic now dwindling and we see household debt beginning to grow. These are signs of recession in the future. So I think we have to take a step back and say there are some serious concerns here and what could be done from a policy standpoint to try to head this off. So, you know, if you look at it from the point of view of somebody, you know, economics layperson listening to this conversation, the two are almost different things. Inflation means overheating. You need to raise interest rates to try and control inflation, which is price rise, which is obviously politically sensitive. Recession, on the other hand, means that there's no economic activity. Traditionally, you should have them, you know, at other ends, each at different ends of the spectrum. But what you're saying is they could be coming together, which is which is stagflation, in other words. So in high prices, prices are rising, but yet there's unemployment and yet economic activity is going down. Worst of both worlds. Uh, yes, that's exactly what we're talking about is a stagflation situation, which, as you just said, that's the worst from both sides. So this is a, a dire economic scenario that you just don't want to be in. But if, again, if we look at what's happening around you, because interest rates are rising, you see money coming out of the stock market and therefore the stock market coming down in value. We see strikes looming in the United States, which is going to put pressure on employers to have to pay more. We see student debt bills now becoming due spikes in oil prices, and overall, there's a, a global slump economically. So again, I, I don't want to be somebody who is all negative, but the facts are the facts here. And this is all something that we need to be 
very cognizant of what could happen. So in other words, it's almost a reversal of the situation that we were seeing a few years ago where growth was proceeding okay and inflation was down and interest rates were, were down, which meant that economic activity could happen. The problem with this situation is that the authorities don't quite know what to do because if they keep interest rates high, it will help with the inflation, but it makes the recession worse. And if you do it the other way around, then inflation persists. That's true. So you have to look at it this way. The approach that's been taken right now in terms of supply and demand, which will be the cause of inflation. So we've had high demand and not enough supply. So the approach has been, let's try to bring down demand. Therefore, we can we can put supply and demand in balance and get inflation under control. So because tampering down demand doesn't seem to be working as effectively as they thought, how about not paying as much attention to the demand side and doing everything possible to lift the supply side, because no matter when this comes in balance, it doesn't matter where it is. So I have always been a proponent of the supply side of economics. I would have approached this a little bit differently and focused exclusively on supply, because if you can solve the problem that way, we don't have a lot of these issues which are now flaring up. But some of the supply side issues are also linked to global factors that may not be in anybody's control, like the war between you know Russia and Ukraine or whatever's happening in China, with China becoming a rogue actor in this entire philosophy. So those are those are problems that are not in anyone's control. And who knows when those will be solved? Well, they weren't in control in the past, right? So you're right in saying, look, domestic and international events can occur that could be out of your control. But what I would hope that the United States has learned is you cannot have a single basis for your supply. Those supply chains need to be spread out domestically and internationally so that you are not tied into, let's say, one area, which in the United States' case, in many ways, it was linked to China. And China is, is not necessarily a friend of the United States. So you have to look at that and say, look, we need to be able to get our supplies from many places around the world. And I think we're starting to see that change specifically related to India. I think more supply chains are opening up for the United States through India. Do you think the shift to countries like India is something that is going to become irreversible? It's not that the US and India don't uh, you know, disagree on some issues, they do, but there seems to be a growing feeling that a certain section and a large section of the supply chains do need to move to a country like India, which will, of course, be a big thing for the India story. Oh, absolutely. Look, the, the issue here is, is to have countries that are doing business together be aligned economically, working together for mutual benefit, as opposed to each side trying to outdo the other. And I think that's what we're seeing with the United States and China. I think that there is a friendlier environment and relationship between the United States and India, which can be mutually beneficial. Look, India has a lot of production potential. The United States has a huge appetite for products. These things go together quite well. So yes, I do see a lot more international um, trade between the United States and India into the future. And when you're looking at that supply that the supply side issues which you were just referring to, how do you, in your view does India compare to let's say a Vietnam or a Mexico which is closer to the US or other countries in Southeast Asia? India much larger, of course. Uh, well, listen, it, that's the point. India has so much more potential because the amount of population and and the amount of production that there's the potential for it gives India the advantage. But of course, you also have to look at the the pricing aspect and the quality. And I believe that if India puts itself in a position 
to be very competitive in the price and the quality of the goods that they're supplying, there's no reason why they would not be able to outperform other countries in, in, in Asia. All right, uh, uh, Daniel, thank you so much uh, for joining us. And let's hope that happens because I think India has been able to solve some of the issues around logistics and infrastructure and digital. So those used to be problems that have been sorted out. What to your mind would be some of the issues that you think companies and others in America would still be worrying about when it comes to India? Well, Too I, far away, other issues, policy flip-flops, what would be the concern areas? Well, look, anytime you're, you're dealing with the international situation, there's a lot of unknowns, right? Because civil unrest, wars, and other things can, can crop up. I think it's a matter of... Uh, American companies developing a trust in the stability of India's economy, its workforce, and its government. And I think Prime Minister Modi has really tried to focus in on this area in terms of growing that relationship and putting forth a message to say, listen, you can trust that India literally will deliver on its promises. And I think as that proves out more and more over time, the relationship between U.S. companies and U.S. consumers and India will, will have to grow. All right, Daniel, thank you so much for joining us with that perspective. Thank you. Thank you.